My name is Margaret M. Mitchell. I teach New Testament and early Christian literature here at the University of Chicago um, in the Divinity School and the college. It's truly an honor for me to participate even in a small way in this conference, recognizing the immense achievements and stature of Buzzy Fish Bay. I have the deepest possible admiration for my colleague of yay these 25 years, for his immense erudition, breadth of expertise, powers of conversation, hermeneutical sophistication, and humanity. I also share with Buzzy an endless fascination with the hermeneutical variability of scriptural texts. The second set of papers in the session this morning is dedicated to rabbinic hermeneutics. We have two papers by Professor Natalie Dorman and by Professor Joanna Weinberg. Um, the, and the first will be by Professor Dorman and then we will follow the same format as the last session uh, with uh, questions after uh, both uh, lectures. So it's a pleasure to introduce and welcome back to Swift Hall, Natalie Dorman. Natalie Dorman is Associate Director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and Adjunct Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies, in the Department of Religious Studies, as well as being a faculty member in Jewish Studies program a member of the graduate groups of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and the Department um, of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Dorman is a specialist on Jewish and Roman law in the imperial period and late antiquity. She is co-editor and contributor to five signally important volumes. I'll name just a few. In 2013, Jews, Christians, and the Roman Empire, The Poetics of Power in Late Antiquity, with Annette Yoshiko Reed. In 2021, Legal Engagement, the Reception of Roman Tribunals and Law by Jews and Other Provincials of the Roman Empire, Le Droit et les Tribunaux Romains Vus par les Juifs et les Autres Habitants L'Empire, together with Catel Bertelot and Capucine, Capucine Nemo Peckelman. And now in press, for which we eagerly await, Worlds of Jewish Law, Postmodern Legal Cultures in the Making with Mark Herman and Misha Perry. For the last decade, Professor Dorman has served as co-editor of the Jewish Quarterly Review. Among her many essays and articles is a recent study, Pax Tainitica, um, in Jewish Quarterly Review in 2022. The title of her paper today is On the Tainitic Management of the Second Temple Literary Inheritance. Please join me in welcoming Professor Natalie Dorman. Thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it very much. And thanks to Sam uh, for inviting me here. Thanks to the Divinity School and the Jewish Studies Program for putting on this conference um, to honor my great teacher. I'm so really delighted and honored and moved to be part of this uh, celebration. And it's, it's true that I just would have had an entirely different life on earth had I not uh, been accepted to be a student of Michael Fishbane. He, um, he must have been distracted when the uh, applications came in. Uh, <laughs> but in taking me on, he not only opened my eyes to an entire world of texts, taught me to appreciate them uh, with, uh, as dynamic, deliberative, and creative acts of making at every turn. Um, every seminar of his, we used to leave as a huddle in a mixture of awe and despair. Uh, <laughs> awe, like the, the constant refrain was, how did he? He do that. that. That was amazing what just happened in there and this sense that we could never actually replicate it. So it was, um, it was a, a wonderful uh, yin and yang of experience. Um, and to the testaments yesterday of uh, Professor Fishbane's um, personal attention and growth, I will say I had a slightly different, my, for me, I was terrified of Michael Fishbane. He had such awe and stature. He was intimidating. Um, and inspiring at the same time, he was a Dr. Vater for me in the, old, in the old sense of the term, under whom I worked harder and learned more than at any other time in my life. So it's with gratitude that I'm here. Okay. It is beyond a doubt 
that early rabbinic Agadah partook of what we might call the scriptural world of Second Temple Judaism. Not only have scholars traced a catalog of specific motifs from classical Midrash back to earlier sources, but as Michael Fishbane has deftly shown in his analyses of biblical and Second Temple materials, profound hermeneutical con commonalities bind the rabbis to their Jewish antecedents. Yet the form and means of the transmission of Second Temple Agadah into rabbinic Midrash remains a mystery. The rabbis deny us entry into their libraries, investing considerable energy in erasing the traces of their specific literary influences. So while close and often virtuosic scholarly spade work may unearth a rare glimpse of direct contact, as for example, the few proposed by Ilan and Noam in their major work on Josephus and the rabbis, determining the what's and how's of transmission often and reasonably involves the positing of an imagined, shared but now lost set of works to which the authors of the preserved texts had mutual access, a corpus that Ilan and Noam dub a lost Atlantis. What do we think these lost shared works look like? Some sort of compendium like Kugel's Traditions of the Bible or Ginsburg's Legends of the Jews, a collection of sayings in the manner of Q, a quasi-concordance such as Kasher's Torah Shlema? Do we imagine an ad hoc survival of lore and legend carried over from the political and military ravages of the millennium's first century and a half? We don't know. It's an imagined corpus after all, but we may hypothesize. Since indeed we do know one thing. Overwhelmingly, the literary form that agotic thinking took in the pre-rabbinic library was authored, long form, mostly prose, narratives. By authored, I mean in broad terms, communicating with a unified and unifying authorial voice, whether named or not. Now this is true across a range of variables in Hebrew and Aramaic, as well as Greek texts, and describes mutatis mutandis, pseudepigraphy, epitome, novel, historiography, apocalyptic, and pointedly, the texts often described as rewritten Bible. Uh, note that I've co-opted the word agadah here in this paper to encompass both rabbinic and non-rabbinic Jewish texts that directly engage with the non-legal, but especially narrative portions of scripture. So even if we soften our notion of what constituted the Bible in the Second Temple, as works such as Reeves and Rojak insist we must, it is clear that some combination of pre-canonical scriptures, intertextuality, and exegetical practices comprise the deep structure of much, if not all of this literature, from Jubilees and First Enoch, to later Antiquities, Life of Adam and Eve, and Fourth Ezra, and close reading reveals certain distinctive hermeneutical assumptions. Now, whether these Second Temple narratives were animated primarily by means of interpretation, were drawn from legendary or folkloric traditions, or are the result of exuberant authorial invention, and of course, all of these three things uh, are at play, the library is a testament to what Naiman wonderfully calls Torah's generative vitality in the Jewish literary imaginary and tells us what pious literate elites understood to be an accepted and effective way to comprehend, extend, and adapt authoritative scriptures for their own worlds and communities. They communicate as well something of how their audiences were conditioned to consume Torah writ large. In other words, setting aside any discussion of themes and content, through its commitment to long-form narrative writing, what we might term the agotic corpus of the preserved Second Temple Library manifests a scriptural habitus, a way of engaging and thus knowing the Bible, of knowing and thinking biblically. Parabiblical narratives multiply Torah in the world by inhabiting and ventriloquizing it, spinning it into the present mimetically, broadening and interpreting the scriptural base by re replicating the Bible's narrative genres and animating its characters as actors and authors. By contrast, Whatever Tana Edik Midrash is, we can say with confidence that it's emphatically not a narrative genre. Narrative, in Barris' terms, requires consistent characters and a plot that may be arranged in linear time, some conflict or change of state, and I would posit it requires an anchoring author idea. Though not nearly to the extent of the later Amoraic Midrash, Tana Edik Midrash does contain some narrative, of course, but my point is that these storioli never extend over more than a few lines of text. Some of these appear as modular and exemplary genres, such as ma'ase and mashal. Most are fragmentary and would be incomprehensible if excerpted. 
Now, narratological tools can and have been fruitfully applied to these to Midrashic stories. I think of the great work of our honoree, of Frankel, Levinson, Ofer Meir, Rubinstein, and others. But the regular appearance of the word narrative in the titles of studies of Midrash may make opaque what to me is the more important literary headline, namely that in the context of the Jewish parascriptural landscape, the genre of Tanaitic Agadic Midrash is a decided outlier. Not only is it not narrative, but is, by my reading, systematically and intentionally counter-narrative. This, on the one hand, seems more than obvious. One doesn't pick up the sifra and confuse it with an epic poem. But on the other hand, not so much. And as I was writing this talk, I dropped the phrase rabbinic narrative into the search window of academia.edu, and it returned 28,000 hits. <laughs> Add to this the casual glossing of Agadah by the word narrative, and it becomes clear that the elision of the terms midrash and narrative is an entirely domesticated one in the field. And yet, in short, after more than two or more centuries of the Jewish production of long-form author authored narrative works, works that engage with texts and traditions that make it into the canon, the Tanaim just stop. It's strange. This emerging elite, literate cadre of Torah experts and religious reformers effect a generic reorientation that has drawn my attention for many years. I started to be curious about the non-narrative nature of Tanaitic Midrash under Buzzi's tutelage, writing a dissertation tracing it to legal hermeneutical logics and disruptions. In this paper, I'm constructing a different, though related, genealogy of the phenomenon, one that situates it in conversation with the rabbi's own literary past. Now, my focus today is uh, inner Jewish, but I will note that the Tanaitic era, read the High Imperial Era, produced tons of long-form narrative. The rabbis were awash in it, in verse and prose, right? You can go on Virgil, Ovid, Apuleius, the Greek novel, Tacitus, the Gospels, biographies, martyr acts, dialogues, and more. I'd include here significantly the race gestae, and note that Augustine's confessions are just over the horizon. Um, this is a related story. Um, I've explored a little elsewhere, but want to do more. So if we can look past the normalization of Midrash as a genre by later rabbinic reception, and ask instead what the Midrash reveals about its own particular reception of Second Temple scripturalisms, the significance and polemical function of its formal choices come into better view. Certain notable elements, I will suggest, offer us purchase on the elusive question of what I see as an agonistic relationship between the rabbis and the Jewish literary past. In the absence of direct citation, polemical treatises, or other dispositive evidence of literary contact, which again, the rabbis are demonically effective at erasing, we must approach the question obliquely. I will shift focus therefore from the business of tracing motifs and look instead at formal phenomena. I will aggregate what I think in this crowd will be very familiar literary features of Tanaitic Agadic Midrash in ways that I hope will make them less familiar, as an attempt to reassess the cultural and arguably political work accomplished by them in historical context. The rabbis have built a parabiblical genre that not only does not replicate the biblical imaginary of prior and contemporary Jews, but actively undermines it on key levels, denying its existence and precluding not only its transmission, but the recrudescence of its forms at all. Midrash from this angle represents a deep uprooting of a form of biblical knowing, and it seems to me that their strategies are effective. Indeed, neither authorial attribution nor long-form narrative reappear in normative Judaism as Jewish forms for centuries to follow. Um, you may have noted another aside that in this paper as a shorthand, when I say Midrash, I'm really talking about Tanaitic Agadic uh, Midrash. So Midrash arrives in the scriptural scene of ancient Judaism like a sweater turned inside out, or a creature with an exoskeleton. What I mean by that is that what had been invisible in so much Second Temple writing, such as, for example, the actual words of scriptural base text, however defined, the specific questions powering the machinery of exegesis, intertextuality, and the hermeneutical concepts that underwrote so much temple, Second Temple composition, is now, with Midrash, the visible textual surface. It's like we've lifted the curtain, or better, walked into the factory to see how the meaning was made. 
Formal and book history elements most relevant to my argument include lemmatic atomization and citation, neither of which I think need much explaining. I'll pause a bit longer on two complex literary agents of the Midrash, the named rabbi and the unnamed author. So the first, prior to the arrival of the halakhic midrashim, lemmatic atomization as an exegetical form was restricted to niche realms, such as Philo's philosophical commentaries on the Pentateuch and Mantic Pesharim of Qumran. For a host of reasons, while Midrash does preserve shards of and allusions to longer stories, as broken up, reordered, and reduplicated by lemmatic reading practices, Agadic Midrash clearly does not lend itself to reconstitution into any single coherent narrative. The second distinctive an immediately manifest element of Agadic Midrash is that it is a citation genre. Explicit verbatim citation can be found in some Second Temple sources, such as the Temple Scroll, and in the Bible itself, as we know very well from what we called in grad school rever reverently the Big Blue Book, by which I mean, of course, biblical interpretation in ancient Israel. But citation and proof texting are quite rare in the Second Temple Library, especially in the narratives. Even so, a powerful bibliocentrism on the part of modern readers tends to make us see it where it is not. I think of the elaborate scholarly apparatus in Charlesworth's two-volume Old Testament pseudepigrapha, for example, where the margins are used to link every turn of phrase, every whiff of a notion to a specific biblical verse, when in fact, however, Second Temple Agadic texts themselves are elusive and paraphrastic and not citational. Any direct reuse of biblical phrasing that happens to appear is not flagged as such by shifts in language, medium, or introductory formulae. These latter tools are rather Midrash's brick and mortar. Citation is a central epistemological and rhetorical technology of the rabbis. Beyond authorizing, providing evidence for a given interpretation, proof texting accomplishes many things. Prime among them is canon formation. Early, Midrash only cites what it deems to be scripture. No other writings are quoted, nor even mentioned, leaving us with a new, clearly demarcated and authorized library. What is not cited is functionally erased. Citation is thus a political, creative, uh, meaning-making act, but is also a political and a polemical act. As, as can be gleaned from modern scholarly articles with titles such as critical citation as an anti-colonial practice or citational practices as a site of resistance and decolonizing attribution, traditions, and exclusions, citation may serve on the one hand to gatekeep and, not, and it may disrupt the status quo on the other. The Tana'im are doing both. Their citation practices wrap dramatic innovation in the conservative clothing of commentary. Canonical boundaries are further reinforced through proof texting habits that subordinate the individual book to the canonical whole. Sifre Devarim, Sifre De Deuteronomy, for example, is typical in being a lemmatic commentary on only some parts of the book of Deuteronomy, yet it nonetheless cites verses from almost every other part of scripture. Fixing preferred wording, knitting the canon to itself exegetically, and in so doing, it argues implicitly that Deuteronomy as a book is not a necessary unit of analysis, while the canonical whole is. Beyond the book, the relentless midrashic disassembly of the surface of the biblical story into fragments further disrupts the narrative context and logics of both source and proof text. And overall, proof texts are most commonly collocated to identify a sacred pattern or norms, both atemporal modes of ordering knowledge, and thus often systematically overwhelm temporal narrative linearity. So I will spend the rest of my talk uh, on the last two elements identified above, the named rabbi and the question of the author. These two are, ideas are entangled, but they are not co-equal. Narratives are held together by an author idea, the illusion of a singular voice, a creator who guarantees a narrative's contents, contains its meaning, and bears witness to its reliability and significance. In this sense, coherent narratives presume authors whether they are named or not. I will describe just how, in literary terms, Midrash dissolves author function so understood, and along with it, the narrative as a defining parabiblical genre. The third facet, then, of Midrashic inside-outness is the appearance of the named rabbi, 
Many, many dozens are named across the tenetic corpus. But where did they come from? What are they doing here? Prior to this, the agotic literary imaginary had existed in the epic past, where real-life expositors do not function as characters inside their texts. Even Qumran's teacher of righteousness never gets a proper name. Scribes and other Torah experts, teachers, and meaning brokers before the rabbis nearly never identify themselves in their literature. Anonymity and pseudepigraphy were the common and accepted authorial and exegetical postures. The named rabbi, like the proof text, is central to the authorizing rhetoric of the genre. But significantly, the rabbi is not an author. He's only ever a character. The Tanaitic corpus is decidedly and distinctively anonymous. The Tana as a character models a way of engaging with scripture, and by means of that with God, law, man, and cosmos. He communicates a certain mode of the textualization of knowledge, part of which demands a clear divide between reader and scripture. It is a depiction of an urban literate sub-elite in the Roman provinces. The literary fashioning of the rabbi is unusual, to put it mildly. In the Tanaitic corpus, the rabbi gets a name and a title, and if you're very attentive, also some intellectual lineage. But the very fact of being named accords the very fact of being named accords status, and that status is both proven and reinforced through the exegetical merit and learning demonstrated by, throughout. So far, so good. This figuration, however, eschews other literary emblems of social and intellectual prestige, tropes that were pervasive in both Jewish and Roman contexts from which the Midrash emerges. One of those is the idea of the reader, reading. No aulus gallius he, our rabbi character never reads anything other than the books of his newly canonized Bible. Moreover, the reading even of this is dematerialized. Reading is the central activity depicted by the genre, but outside of liturgical contexts, the quotidian act itself is not depicted as such. No reference works are unfurled on a dais, the physical study hall is rarely part of a settingless midrashic conversation. No rabbi looks up in the middle of reading to greet a student or answer a question or loses his place or nods off in the evening over a page of anything. In this way, reading is dramatically curtailed in the symbolic apparatus of cultural and religious authority. We ought not to assume that this was the norm. If we focus on the Jewish corpus alone, though much in this line can be said of much in this line can be said in the context of the contemporary Roman ambit, the trope of the act of reading has a long history of being part of the performance not only of intellectual and cultural prestige and expertise, but of authority, communal authority, gnosis, and holiness. In the biblical books, of course, Moses reads the law to Israel, the king is read a Torah scroll copied for him by priests. Shaphan reads a book of he found in the temple to a distraught King Josiah. Ezra reads the correspondence with King Artaxerxes. Daniel reads the writing on the wall. An angel reads to Zechariah from a giant flying scroll. And I could go on. The later book of Jubilees is arguably a long pageant of biblical characters encountering all sorts of important texts as texts in their materiality. A second element I want to underscore is writing. In the same vein, writing is not dramatized in the Midrash. Rabbis speak, they do not inscribe. Again, nothing new to anyone here. They're not scribes. By this I mean, not that they don't or can't write, they most certainly could and did. Unlike their Jewish, Roman, and Christian neighbors, they almost are almost never depicted writing. They are not shown composing letters or sitting at a desk recording the day's proceedings or their opinions on the law, and they certainly do not transcribe revealed words dictated from on high or any other source. The sources clearly do not wish to affiliate the rabbi with the scribal elite, so utterly central to Second Temple scripturalism and to scribal conceptions of access to the divine. In both their ideal economy of memorization and as a trope, writing is excised from their arsenal of authorizing symbols. Now, speaking of scribes, we as scholars know that most of the Second Temple Library and Biblical Library is aggregate, composed in layers. The author of Deuteronomy and Daniel and First Enoch were not solitary geniuses. We know this. But the author of those texts was a school or a class of authors and redactors developing a text over time. And yet these texts cohere through the centripetal force 
of narrative framing and the, conven and the conventions of a unified voice. Of Midrash, by contrast, Jaffe writes of collective authorship, not as a fact of Midrash necessarily, but it, as an intended rhetorical effect. And this, I suggest, is yet another literary aspect of Midrash that is an element of its exoskeleton. It dramatizes the many hands that go into the production of any literary work and asserts it as the norm, thus destabilizing any fiction of, of uh, any authorial unified, unified authorial fictions. Though the Tanaitic corpus is anonymous as any of the parabiblical literature that preceded it, it has altered the author function typical of sources dealing with biblical narratives. Midrash transforms even the most compelling stories from the biblical epic into resonant fragments. In this, Midrash resembles known ancient Near Eastern mantic, sapiential, and contemporary legal genres that are not, as Gabai says of Mesopotamian commentaries, exegetical treatises written by a master scholar presenting his own ideas. Rather, they stand somewhere in the middle between communal and individual, uniform and dynamic. Indeed, such compositional habits are clearly reflected by the Tanaim, but their familiarity from other contexts may mask the reorientation this importation affects on narrative in particular in their, con in their own time. A third element of the rabbi I want to underscore is biography. The other meaningfully not there element of rabbinic character portrayal that set it apart from the authorizing conventions around them. The rabbis are named in the Agotic, the, the rabbis named in the Agotic Midrash are no doubt the rock stars of their generations. Yet the Akiba and Ishmael of the Mechilta, for example, are not deployed as well-rounded personages. Biographical details are achingly few, and any that sneak in are ad hoc. We will not be told the year of their birth, nor where they prepped, they are, if they are funny or fat, what their houses look like, or how many children and slaves they had, or if they prefer fancy sandals, we will certainly not be told what they have read. Eschewing what must be seen as the widespread biographical habit around them, no Tana inspires a Philostratus or Diogenes Laertius, a Testament, or a Matthew or a Eusebius to lionize him as a sage, teacher, and paragon. And if some rabbi did inspire his own Plato to write about his life, that work never made it into print. Goldhill on this topic notes how Midrashic knowledge is never cataloged by teacher. No one collects and publishes the dicta or the pious acts of Rabbi Plony. It follows, he notes, that absent biography, we cannot get a robust, robust hagiography, and this must be by design. An exceptional personage may emerge from the materials as a stand-in for an interpretive school or a theological tendency, right? One thinks of Hillel or Ishmael but he is not depicted as anchoring a cult of personality, and this whether he did so or not. And I bet some of them did. In the realm of action, Tanaitic Midrash is largely uninterested in the rabbi's political and social relationships. Titles are undifferentiated and democratic, and though real rabbis certainly lived what I might term political lives in relationship to one another, competing, jostling for access, engaging in feuds and friendships, anything that smacks of influence peddling, with some exceptions, these play off offstage. The rabbinic character has stature. He demands respect, models piety and decorum, and demonstrates mastery. But he does not, as a rule, visibly flex his power or personality. As an intellect, he is dazzling. But as an individual, his depiction is flat. This, of course, changes significantly in the, uh, in the, uh, under the Amorim, Amorim and in the Babylonian Gomorrah all of which adds up to a rather mixed message. Named sages appear in Tanaitic literature all of a sudden. They represent a sort of audacious incursion from backstage of a class of formidable, living, real experts, pulling the exegetical frame of reference out of the epic past and into the now, and making a clear assertion of religious and communal leadership. While in the same breath, his particularity is definitively contained, subsumed and muted by the exegetical and theological whole. This is consistent with a larger rabbinic allergy to concentrated and ex officio individual power. The Tanaim ridicule the high priest, proclaim the end of prophecy, reject minoritarianism, marginalize the scribe, and more or less ignore the details of temporal rule. This is obviously a way to quiet rivals and set themselves at the center of a reinvented Judaism, but it is not incidental that they subject themselves, literarily, to a similar diminution. 
This allergy to individual political authority and the source's rhetorical ambivalence about the stature of the rabbi hero, I suggest, is entangled in the deconstruction of author function in Tanaitic library. Midrash's imagined world is populated by rabbinic characters who are scholars but not authors and who evince no interest in books beyond the canonical 24. And remember that besides the Mishnah and Tosefta, the Tanaim write nothing else. If they copied, collected, or transmitted other literatures, they don't let on. In other words, it is not as though when they wear their commentary hat, they do commentary, but other genres flourish alongside it in the manner of their classical and early Christian neighbors. Midrash at its, at its inception is accompanied by a broad reduction in generic variety, which is to say that at issue is not only the difference or similarity between this or that text, but between this or that library. All this leads to the fact that the literature leaves no context for and shuts all avenues to imagining a rabbi functioning as an author, composing or lending coherent meaning to his own solitary work. Now, the rabbis are not the only figures whose specificity and function as individual and as author is curtailed by midrashic form. One significant incarnation of scriptural vitality in the Second Temple Agadah is the biblical character. And this pre-rabbinic library is replete with story cycles that reveal the extent to which biblical characters had full lives of their own. In John Reeves' iconoclastic work on the Bible and early Judaism, he describes a fluid biblicism that encompasses diverse literary instantiations. He speaks, for example, of an Abrahamic lexicon, which names the wealth and variety of Abraham's stories that circulated throughout the ancient and late ancient landscape, appearing in the textual remains of many communities. By his reading, no one of these Abrahamic traditions is meaningfully primary. They all constitute dynamic moments uh, above ver aver as versions. They all constitute versions. Abraham in this way emblematized a sort of living Torah in relation to which we ought to speak of Genesis, Jubilees, the Quran, the Apocalypse, Abraham, the Piyut we heard about this morning, uh, Matthew and Midrash all in the same breath. We can as easily speak of an Enochic lexicon, an Adamic or an Ezran one. It is not of minor interest that so many of the characters around whom these narrative traditions collect are also often figured as scribes and authors themselves. The testamentary literature is made up of first-person life stories issuing from the mouths of biblical characters, as is much apocalyptic writing. Enoch is a scribe, Moses an amanuensis, and among the great authors so depicted in Second Temple Library, we can count Adam, Enoch, all 12 patriarchs, Moses, Isaiah, Baruch, Ezra, and more. So for all its attention to the Bible's narrative stretches, Tanaitic Midrash has a had a similar impact on biblical characters as it had on the rabbinic character. In the Tanaitic Agadah, the biographies of biblical heroes are attenuated, their powers of authorship occluded. This is not to say that Midrash is not interested in these characters deeply. It is infrequently informed by larger narrative frames, and as we all know, the Midrash can elicit in intense human path pathos and complexity in a very few lines. And yet these story field moments are not sustained over long arcs. An emotionally complex Moses in this exegetical complex will give way to a cardboard cutout character in the next. A raging or reviled Moses at the top of the page is not ever squared with Moses the paragon of patient piety on the bottom. There is no cumulative biographical effect. To pick up on uh, a metaphor this morning, Midrash reading practices generate tesserae without mortar. What this means, among other things, is that the great figures of the biblical narrative are once filtered through Midrash in no danger of emerging from the page into authorial autonomy. Thus, not only are books about or attributed to biblical characters purged from rabbinic memory, but for the most potently autonomous biblical characters themselves from the Jewish past, and one must presume from the living Torah horizon of the rabbis themselves, these characters are broken up by Tanaitic Agadah and worked back into the text. Midrash thus disperses these figures exegetically, with the result that they lose the potency they could potentially marshal as the unmediated protagonists and authors of long-form narrative. Midrashic form prevents Adam and Abraham and Enoch from ever again developing a life and literature of their own, especially one capable of being confused with scripture. We should not therefore be surprised then that the rabbis have a complicated relationship to the ultimate biblical author, Moses himself, 
well, God, but let's stick with Moses. <laughs> in an article on this topic, Yair yeah, Furstenberg opens with the off-reference scene from Minahot 29b, in which Moses is the dull student standing at the back of the study house who doesn't understand his own Torah. Furstenberg then reads a set of Tanaitic Agadot to show, and I quote, the direct refutation of Moses the author, whose authority as the most wise or knowledgeable is undermined, and who instead becomes the ignorant messenger of the truth. Current interpreters, in contrast, are presented as possessing direct access to knowledge through their sophisticated exegetical methods, end quote. And here we have arrived at the house of Bayezid. At some point in the second century, a new form of agotic engagement with the biblical narratives emerges, which appears to turn the process of parascriptural creation inside out, revealing the chaotic, dynamic work of meaning-making. The previously invisible exegetical labor of lematic reading, collective authorship, and intertextuality are all made plain to see. The raw materials of the process of scriptural thinking are here disassembled. The working of the hermeneutical mind is made visible. By means of its historically and contextually discordant literary choices, Midrash signals its resistance to narrative. It keeps us inside the factory, to hew stubbornly to my original metaphor, and the factory never issues a finished product, a grand, memorable, monovocal tale, some epic that stars the rabbis, for example, with a clean beginning and ending, a literary artifact that could render the machinery and manpower of its production invisible or even irrelevant. Moreover, by cutting off other means of production, this process prevents their future manufacture. In this way, the work of interpretation is presented as both means and end. If we need to speak of one literary product issuing from the factory, it's scripture itself, redefined. Halbertal says of the Tanakh that a severe form of censorship is concomitant to the act of sealing. Tanaitic discursive forms are vital a active agents in this operation. Indeed, Midrash's caesura in literary form aligns with the canonical watershed, reflecting an epistemic realignment with theological, political, and social consequences. Now, the, the one spot where uh, first and second century, again, I'm dealing with this early, early um, strata, where first and second century Tana'i may have made room for uninterrupted longish prose is the synagogue or the imagined synagogue of the Tana'im, though the relationship to that institution is far from straightforward. Lectionary reading cycles and their targumim preserve in small narrative in small chunks, keeping agotic expansions generically, institutionally, and performatively under the heel of their sanctioned scriptures. The late antique synagogue, by contrast, becomes a place where longer narrative structures begin to emerge or re-emerge in fuller form, as we heard this morning, um, and in late midrash such as Turkey Rabbi Eliezer. Early rabbinic midrash harnesses scripture's generative vitality and redirects it back through one small library. Authorship is not exactly eschewed, but is fitfully reimagined as part of the construction of a new way of knowing scripturally, one in which both the storytelling impulse and the narrative inheritance are transformed into a collection of disparate threads woven repeatedly back into the warp and woof of the biblical surface. I've chosen to focus today on the fate of Second Temple narrative writing in the context of emergent rabbinism. I want to note that narrative is just one piece of the complex literary polysystem in which the Tanaitic Midrash participates. Nor have I asked the whence or the why of Tanaitic Midrashic literary innovation. I've tried rather to step back and look at Midrashic form phenomenologically and describe the impact of that form on other modalities of writing. But modalities of writing are modalities of thinking and knowing. Midrashic exegesis is a tool useful for opening up a closed and canonical text no less than is narratively coherent Book of Watchers, and the divine will be, uh, the divine will may be known and communicated by inhabiting and mimicking the Bible just as well as by analyzing it atomistically. As a result, what we find with Midrash is more than just an epiphenomenon of canonical closure, but represents an epistemic reordering. Now, we don't know what exactly of the Second Temple Library the rabbis read or when they read it, but to explain lack of citation as an indication of not knowing seems to swallow too easily the rhetorical dish the Midrash is serving us. In the absence of specific evidence, I have focused on the draconian excision of key literary tools from the forms they choose to transmit, to suggest that they not only were keenly aware of the Second Temple Library in some form, but saw it as a threat to their own project of renewal. Early Midrash erects a strong set of safeguards that function as a tell. 
Its formal and book history features are evidence that they knew a Second Temple Agadic library that looked, at least in formal terms, very much like the one we know now. There is a fierce Puritanism in the Tanitic sources, a sort of generic tzimtzum, a stripping back to studs and a rebuilding on new scriptural and generic bases, a reallocation of cultural capital, and a political and theological reorientation worked out on the field of literature. So in the end, I've made a historical argument. Early Midrash marks an inflection point, and unlike its motifs, which can often and have been traced back to pre-Rabbinic sources, its form tells another parallel story, one less of continuity than of conscious decoupling. It is a transform it's a transformational poetics for a transitional era. If you followed me this far, the next question must be, why? What was gained by removing both narrative and a strong author idea from the rabbinic cultural arsenal, and what was lost? For a small movement at its very start, narrative and author figures would have offered extremely powerful and useful community-building tools. Apparently, the dispatching of both was a necessary and useful sacrifice. But on this question, I am delighted to say I'm out of time. Thank you for listening. It's my honor to introduce the second speaker for this session. Johanna Weinberg is Professor Emerita in Early Modern Jewish History and Rabbinics at the University of Oxford, where she taught rabbinic literature and medieval and Jewish literature and history. She has translated and edited the works of the major Jewish Renaissance scholar, Azaria de Rossi. More recently, she collaborated with Anthony Grafton of Princeton University on the Hebrew studies of the great Huguenot scholar, Isaac Casabon, um, Harvard University Press, uh, 2011. With Michael Fishbane, she edited and contributed to Midrash Unbound, Transformations and Innovations, Littman Library, 2013. With Scott Mandelbrot, she edited and contributed to Jewish Books and Their Readers, Aspects of Jewish and Christian Intellectual Life in Modern Europe, uh, Brill, 2016. More recently, Together with Piet von Boxel and Kirsten McFarlane, she edited the volume The Mishnaic Moment, Jewish Law Among Jews and Christians in Early Modern Europe. Um, and, uh, it, that, uh, and then she also edited, excuse me, the, um, with Anthony Ga Ga Grafton, she has just completed a book on the major German Reformed Hebraist Johann Buchstorff and his mode of reading, censoring, and printing Jewish literature. The title of Professor Weinberg's paper today is Hermeneutical Theology in the Sermons of Rabbi, R Rabbi Judah Moscato, 1532, question mark, to 1590. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Weinberg. Well, thank you very much. It's such an honor and privilege to be here, to be participating in this beautiful event in honor of our friend, Bazi. Um, I'm really overwhelmed by all the tributes I heard yesterday and today um, and feel, yeah, very honored to be part of it. Let me just add one anecdote of my own. Um, it was in 2004 that I decided in my wisdom to have the first conference on Midrash in Oxford. And in my wisdom as well, I decided that there was only one person that I should have as my uh, keynote lecturer, and that was Michael Fishbeck. And I don't know what got into me, but I just took up the phone, and, and now I don't know how I got your phone number. And I just rang you, and I said, what do you do? And instead of getting just a yes, no, or perhaps, I got this amazing response, lots of questions, uh, talking about concepts, ideas, and that clinched it. Mm -hmm. And then he came, he gave um, the keynote lecture, and the rest is history, a wonderful friendship. Thank you, Basi. In all, Judaism is a vast intertextual system whose internal life expands and contracts through exegesis. Thus, Michael Fishbane, 
who has devoted much of his literary work to demonstrating the truth of this challenging assertion. Throughout his writings, he has shown us that critical reading of sacred texts requires acknowledgments of the various hermeneutical levels that lie embedded within them. Each of the traditional four senses of scripture, however defined, remain discernible to the careful reader and may, no must, be acknowledged, however complex the connection that lies between them. The hermeneutical task that Fishbay sets before the reader of religious texts is more than apparent in the highly polished and intricately woven sermons of Judah Moscato, the Italian rabbi who spent most of his life in Mantua in northern Italy in the intellectually vibrant company of a small elite Jewish scholars such as David Provenzali, Azaria de Rossi and Abraham Portaleone. This small but active Jewish intellectual elite acquired proficiency in a wide range of subjects which, strictly speaking, lay outside the conventional rabbinic curriculum. In very different ways, they all absorbed the cultural renaissance at their doorstep. Tullio or Cicero, no less than Aristotle, Ibn Rush, Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola are but a few of the sources that demanded their attention in their individual and collective Batei Midrash. All these writers, as we will see, were attracted to the Platonic Philo of Alexandria, though there was no unanimity as to the identity of the ancient philosopher and exegete. Indeed, Philo's so-called rabbinic credentials became a mighty bone of contention among these extraordinary scholars. The preeminent exegete and rhetorician in Mantua was most certainly Judah Moscato. His volume of 52 sermons that he himself collected and compiled into their literary form, the Nefutso Tiruda, the Disperse of Judah, was published in Venice in 1589. Though the sermons were delivered for a variety of occasions and in different contexts, Moscato himself imposed a unity on the disparate homilies, by means of a paratext, a prefatory poem linking and, con and enumerating all the sermons, Moscato deliberately set out to convey to the readers the sense of the journey complete with signposts on which they were about to embark. Beginning with song, Ashira Adonai will sing to the Lord, that's the sermon about divine music, and ending Shalom in peace. This introductory text, which has all the semblance of a rhetorical ploy, is actually an exhortation, or rather a proclamation about the spiritual voyage that awaits the conscientious reader. Moscato possessed a thorough knowledge of the classical corpus of Midrashim, and often selected one specific text, called in, in the technical language the Ma'ama, which would be subjected to intense analysis and developed into his own rhetorical and exegetical scheme. He did not shy away from the questions that naturally arise on reading Midra. His hermeneutical tactic was to enlist philosophical, rhetorical, cabalistic, or literary concepts that might pro proffer an explanation or help to account for the Darshan's multi-layered discourse. Intrinsic to this undertaking is that rhetorical or philosophical truths lie embedded in the rabbinic Agadot. Once identified, the key or keys to the homily or tale become apparent and their spiritual me re message recognized. Like his companions in the Mantua and Yeshiva, Moscato indulged in the fashionable etymologizing that allowed for free cross-linguistic borrowing, usually involving Greek and Hebrew. The procedure, as Glenn Moss has demonstrated so beautifully, was to take a word that had a well-defined denotation, and I quote, by various techniques of decomposition and recomposition, transcoded it and allowed a new coherent system of intelligible and interconnected meaning. It is in this manner that Moscato could go as far as to suggest the somewhat surprising etymology that the Greek word idea, especially in its platonic sense, was equivalent to the Hebrew word yedia, knowledge. 
This particular etymology came into play in the seventh sermon entitled The Power of the Torah in the Creation of the World. Moscato began his sermon with a citation of the first and often cited Petitcha of Bereshit Rabbah on the creation of the world. Though familiar, we need to read it again in order to comprehend Moscato's purpose. Rabbi Hoshaya began his homily. Then I was to cite him like an Ammon, and I was his delight, Proverbs 8.30. Ammon means tutor, pedagogue. Ammon means covered. Ammon means hidden. And some say Ammon means great. Ammon is tutor, as it says in Numbers 11.12, as an omen, as a nurse, carries a suckling child. Ammon means covered, as it says in Lamentations 4.5, they were clad. Ha'emunim is scarlet. Ammon means hidden, as it says in Esther 2.7, and he concealed Hadassah. Ammon means great, as it says in Nachum 3.8, are you better than No Ammon, which is rendered in Tragum, are you better than Alexandria the Great, that is situated on the rivers. Another explana explanation. Ammon is artisan. The Torah says, I was the working tool of the Holy One, blessed be he. It is the way of the world that when a human king builds a palace, he does not build it according to his own idea, Rather, he uses the knowledge of an architect, Ha'omen, who does not build it according to his own idea, but uses plans and diagrams, or rather parchments and wax tablets, as, as, as uh, Moscato himself understood it, so as to know how to arrange the rooms and the wicket doors. Similarly, as the Holy One, blessed be he, looked at the Torah and created the world, then the Torah said, by means of the beginning, Bereshit, God created the only beginning, Reshit, is Torah, as it says, the Lord made me at the beginning, Reshit of his way, Proverbs 8.22. Unlike most interpreters, Moscato did not simply focus on the Dava affair, the second part of the Midrash, which prescribes the Torah as a blueprint of creation. Rather, he gave full attention to all elements in the text, both combining and separating different sections and explanations. The exegetical strategy that he employed in decoding the text <clears throat> combined his total absorption of philosophical, specifically Neoplatonic notions, and a highly attuned feeling <clears throat> for the four senses of Scripture. According to Moscato, Rabbi Hoshaya knowingly suggested six different meanings or Platonic causes to be attached to the word Amon in the verse in Proverbs. Then I was by him as, a, as an Amon, pedagogue, tutor, concealed, covered, great, instrument, that's the diagrams, artisan. Though he described them as platonic, he actually meant neoplatonic, probably referring to Proclus's commentary on Timaeus, who expanded the standard Aristotelian four courses, and Moscato seems to have been aware of this, into final, paradigmatic, or in Moscato's translation, <clears throat> Machshavit, that is, I think, ideational or cognizing, efficient, instrumental, formal, and material. The individual causes get applied to the various suggestions posited by Rabbi Hoshaya. The pedagogue refers to the efficient cause, covered means material because it is to be covered by its form, concealed is formal because it's not visible to the senses, great refers to the final and foremost cause, Working tool is instrumental, artisan is ideational or cognized. Rather artificial might be the judgment on Moscato's attempt to account for all the different possible meanings of the word Amon. Yet by detecting the six or four, since he says quite correctly that the two extra causes are simply an expansion of the Aristotelian scheme, where the paradigmatic or the ideational corresponds to the Platonic ideas, idea equals idea, and God's contemplation of the everlasting model of the Torah, the reader is given to understand that no element in the Midrash is superfluous. But all this is just the beginning. Having admitted that the six is also four, Moscato turns to Psalm 51.8. Hen emet hafatsta, behold you have desired truth in the inward parts, Make me, therefore, to know wisdom in my inmost heart. Subjecting the word chafatsta to a notarikon, he applies the four letters in the word you have desired to all four causes. 
Fetrosem represents Chome, the material, Pei Poel, the efficient, Sade Tsura, the formal, and Taf Tachlit, the final. Thus, truth in the psalm, which is the true Torah, called Amon, is implanted in my inmost heart and therefore carries within it all those different levels of meaning. The desire for Torah is, in fact, the desire for apprehension and therefore the need to expel Torah according to the four senses of Scripture. It is noteworthy that here Muscata not only refers to Bachya ben Asher's fourfold scheme and to Pardes, uh, Prashat Tarashrim is a sod, but also alludes to the Italian term senso letterale, allegorico, anagogico, tropologico. This is more than a nod at the role of the four senses in medieval Christian exegesis and preaching. Rather, here, as elsewhere in his sermons, his search for the hermetic truth about the universe is not bounded by his own rich Jewish tradition, which he fully integrated into his own hermeneutical theology. Thus, in an adroit turn, he takes up the four meanings given to the word Amon in the first half of the Midra. No, not only does each ca contain a cause, but also one level of meaning. Thereby, the pedagogue is the literal sense that delivers the outer meaning of Torah, covered is Darash that lies beneath the wing of the Pashat. Concealed is the intellectual sense that is more concealed than Darash, and great is the true sense, a great city encased in the heavens. This established Moscato proceeded to produce even more complex images to demonstrate the interconnectedness of the fourfold senses within Scripture. Yet like many exegetes before him, including Philo and Dante, Moscato knew only too well, and Zoa, that readers had a tendency to latch onto one sense and discard the rest. He also recognized the highest of the exegetical levels of Scripture's spiritual core when he quoted the famous analogy, analogy from the Zohar, 3152a, also cited by Michael Fishburne in his discussion of the four types of interpretation. Rashat is the outer garment of Scripture, its narratives, Drush is its theologies and laws, Remes is the intellectualization without which the ritual action is incomplete, as Sod is the soul of the soul of Torah. Ultimately, the sermon comes to an end with an inspiring mini midrash on Ezekiel 47.12, according to the outlined <coughs> principles of interpretation. Now, in the summary heading of this sermon, Moscato had announced his use of the six Platonic, read Neoplatonic, causes, combined with an explication of the four all-inclusive kinds of interpretation by which the divine Torah is to be expounded. This openly syncretic approach to his hermeneutic task is adopted throughout the sermons and also in his other important pu uh, publication, the Kol Yehuda commentary on the Kuzan, Judah Halevi's Kuzan. Though certainly Moscato had a pr proclivity for Neoplatonic ideas, he was also thoroughly schooled in the art of rhetoric and dialectic, as Altman noted so many years ago. But it should be emphasized that Moscato's attraction to rhetoric and dialectic was not purely academic. Rather, like the dialecticians of his age, Moscos, Moscato set out to teach by means of these disciplines. He had thoroughly scanned Rudolf Agricola's, he was 1444 to 1485, monumental and highly influential uh, De Invenzione Dialectic for whom dialectic was an art and by definition contained a body of precepts useful for life, guiding students to intellectual and moral maturity. Moscato's elegant and in intricate prose should not deceive. This was not simply art for art's sake. His theoretical commitment to eloquence was based on the intention to generate meaningful and significant interpretation of sacred texts. The perfect order of Torah followed the prescriptions of Cicero, Galen, and above all, Agricola. This he demonstrated in his fifth sermon. But the extent to which Moscato enacted his pedagogical goals by following the most fashionable and authoritative masters is strikingly on show in Sermon 11, an elucidation of the short but somewhat obscure Psalm 15. Oh, something missing. 
Oh, that's really a pity. The text of the psalm I had um, is Psalm 15. I'll, I'll read out the English translation, but you must pay attention very carefully. It was supposed to be on the PowerPoint. A psalm of David, Lord, who shall sojourn in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell upon your holy mountain? He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, that has no slander upon his tongue, nor does evil to his fellow, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors them that fear the Lord, he that swears to his own hurt and changes not. He that puts not out his money on interest, nor takes a bribe against the innocent. He that does these things shall never be moved. Uh, you can remember all five verses. Now time is pressing, but I'll try to encapsulate some of the main lines of Moscato's exegesis, which was partly inspired by the Talmudic passage in Makot 24a, I think, in which is suggested that Psalm 15 is a Davidic reduction of the Tariag uh, 613 precepts to 11 actions. The opening verse, according to Mascata's interpretation, alluding to the world of temporary sojourning and to the eternal dwelling in the world to come, serves as a poem to the following four verses. A threefold structure is detected throughout and is already displayed in verse 2, that is, Three relationships that govern a person's existence between God and a person, between person and person, between a person and him herself. Moscato's analysis of the various elements in the psalm are transferred onto a diagram or chart. Uh, I have to say that this is the first time, as far as I know, in the printing of Hebrew text where you have a diagram used for exegesis. It is really the first time. Um, Mascato is seen here instructing his congregants, or more likely his students or colleagues. His interpretation of the psalm is organized here in one single diagram with verse one, the proposition one might say, there on the right, <clears throat> uh, which gets divided into the three relations that are then siphoned up off into Moscato's particular elucidation of the separate elements in the psalm. Verse 4 guides a human in his relationship with God, who must think with God and reject unbelievers, but honor those who fear God, and to keep any oath, however detrimental it may ultimately transpire to be. Interpersonally, according to Moscato, not doing evil to another person actually means going as far as not to retaliate even if one has sustained damage. Nor should one take interest from another person, even if needed. And he adds, with an allusion to Makot 24a, not even from a Gentile, since interest bite will eventually burst and unwittingly scored. Now, not content with this explanation, Moscato then proffers a rather more intricate analysis of the Tsar, which is again uh, illustrated in another chart. Though a new conception of the psalm, it still adheres to some of the main elements, the threefold relationship and the idea of actions that should not be done even if seemingly permitted. Another threefold scheme is folded into the previous one, that of speech, action and thought. Additionally, he situates the psalm like previous commentators, but he claims that they didn't complete the task properly and he's going to do it within the scheme of the Ten Commandments. For Moscato, the first five commandments include the precept to honor parents, incorporate a person's relationship with God, and while four of the remaining five relate to interpersonal behavior, the command not to covet is an admonition for a person not to sin against themselves, rather they should stifle unsavory desires. On this scheme is superimposed a twofold scheme dividing into the idea of the permissible and the non permissible. Of these, in only two circumstances is something permissible, but is clearly to be avoided since it may end in ruin, as is, as is the case of taking interest. 
the intricate workings of three or two under the umbrella of what may or may not be permissible, and the relocation of the psalm into the structure of the Ten Commandments, though rather testing for the reader, does become close on close investigation of his description and diagram. Now this, as I said, is the first example of an explication of a Hebrew biblical text by means of diagrams. Here we see something that Moscato read. Agricola's de Invenzione Dialectica. The subject here is diversity in formulating questions, distinguishing between simple and compound questions and compound propositions into copulative or disjunctive. Moscato and Agricola, each in their separate undertakings, attempted to achieve elucidation through headings and subheadings, thereby enabling the student to grasp the entirety of the issue at hand in one fell swoop. Now, exegesis is at the heart of all Moscato's writing. In addition to Agricola and a host of other authors, Moscato's integrated reading of a vast array of Hebrew writings, including Alvo, Isaac Arama, Yediah Bersi, into his sermons, each author provided material that he could fashion into his own exegetical system. But he also had a predilection for one Platonic author whose status was constantly being questioned and whose works were the object of much discussion in the 16th century and particularly relevant here in the Jewish study house of Mantua. By the end of the 16th century, Philo's writing had been published in Greek, translated into Latin, French and Italian. Each editor and translator had taken their own stand on the identity of Philo and on his contribution to theology and philosophy. It's noted further that despite the conventional desire to detect Philo's proclivity to Christianizing exegesis, the editor of the first Greek edition of Philo's work, Adrien Tourneb, dubbed Philo a pagan author and praised him for championing the liberal dis disciplines. On the other hand, Pierre Bellier, <coughs> the author of the French translation of 1575, referred to, quote, the great and divine Philo, like Moses' secretary, about whom it is said, either Pla Plato plate finalizes or Philo latinizes. The identity of Philo and the interpretation of his works so beloved to the church fathers was not self-evident. It in this context, Jews became involved in the quest to sort out the question of Philo the Jew's Jewishness. Azari de Rossi, the orthodoxy of whose light of the eyes had been subjected to much controversy and, which, and in which his younger friend Judah Moscado had been very much involved, had produced a pioneering study on Yedidia Ha'alessandri, as he uh, dubbed it, the sort of translating the name into, into Hebrew. This was the first attempt to locate Philo in his historical and religious context. His prevaricating conclusion, I cannot absolute absolve or convict him. I should call him neither Rav nor Sage, heretic nor skeptic. My only name for him shall be Yedidia the Alexandrian. This statement didn't meet with approval from some of his Jewish colleagues. David Provincali responded with a long critique. He was on a mission to undermine de Rossi's unjustified verdict, I quote, on a righteous and perfect man, a worker of righteousness who spoke truth, the sage, perfect in every respect, Rabbi Yedidia the Alexandrian Jew of priestly stock. Provençali, as we see, conferred smicha on Philo. As did Moscato, who tacitly, tacitly followed Provençal. Indeed, it would appear that Moscato had found a kindred spirit in Rabbi Yedidia. He invoked Philo on 11 occasions in his sermons, five times in his commentary on the Kuzari. The reader of Moscato's writings would most certainly be left with the impression that Philo was yet another rabbinic authority worthy of a seat among the assembly of wise Talmudic rabbis and medieval authorities. But Moscato didn't simply cite Philo. He appreci appreciated and explicitly tried to adopt Philo's exegetical practices. A prime example of his expression of indebtedness to Philo is articulated in the Sir Ushavuot Pentecost, which is devoted to the question often debated in rabbinic writings whether action or study 
takes priority in the religious life. In the course of this complex philosophical and exegetical discourse, Moscato wove an al elaborate allegory on the basis of the story of Dinah and her brothers Simeon and Levi. Moscato admitted that his exegetical approach had been stimulated by the wise Rabbi Philo's discourse, to which he had added his own contribution and from which he had also deviated. The relevant passage from De Mutatione Nominum does indeed demonstrate the extent to which Philo's approach to the story of Genesis 34 informed Moscato's own interpretive stance. According to Philo, the two brothers Shimon and Levi represent one front, I quote, bear the stamp of a single fall that unites hearing Simeon with action Levi. Dinah represents incorruptible judgment, the justice which is assessor of God. The etymological play on the names of the biblical stories protagonists is exploited to the full by Moscato, who expands and develops the Philonic interpretation into a complex philosophical allegory. In Moscato's hands, Shimon becomes the symbol of speculative intellect in its capacity to hear the divine word, Levi the symbol of practical intellect that brings about right action, and Dinah is the one that brings judgment by actualizing the Heilic intellect. Philo's observation that scripture seemed to treat Shimon and Levi as one provided Moscato with an exegetical clue. Study, or the speculative intellect, needs to go hand in hand with practice, the practical intellect. Moscato's own allegory is indeed much more complicated than Philo's and masks the original question in an array of philosophical concepts that complicate rather than explicate. Yet on his own admission, a close reading of Philo had led him on this particular exegetical path. Philo's allegorical method was appealing to him, but so too the actual content of his discourses. In a long and wide-ranging sermon developed, uh, delivered on Sukkot, on Tabernacle, the festival which embodies the idea of human fragility and consequent dependence on God, Moscato reflected on the need for all human beings to trust and hope in God. Many hermeneutical twists and turns characterize Moscato's sermon. Particularly suggestive was the chiastic structure of verse 14 in Psalm 27, Hope, cave for the Lord, be strong and take hope, and hope, cave for the Lord. Having offered some etymological reflections on the meanings inherent in the word cave, Moscato then developed his thing. Hope is a special quality for the wise man. This is what Rabbi Yedidya, called Filone, wrote in the sixth work of his opera, in Quadriterius Potiori Siliari Solia. There, he says, that it is a special quality of the wise person to hope for the acquisition of good from the gracious, true, blessed God. He further says that scripture alludes to this idea when it says, And to Seth a son was born, and he called him Enoch. Then there was a beginning, Ucha, on calling on the name of God, Genesis 4.26. Did then, this is the book of the generations of Adam, Genesis 5.1. According to Philo, I'm still quoting Moscato, Huchal is related to the idea of hope, Tochele, okay, such that the verse reads, and then there was a beginning of hoping in the blessed God. This is why the statement is immediately followed by the words, this is the book of the generations of Adam. It signifies that the person who does not possess the quality of hope does not deserve to be called Adam for such is the way he should be defined. And that sage, i.e. Philo, interprets the word enosh in relation to the word tochelet, hope. I don't know the sources for his etymology. However, this feature of the language must have been common knowledge for them, as exemplified in the verse in Jeremiah 17, 16, neither have I desired the woeful anush day, or in the day of grief and of desperate pain, anush, Isaiah 17, 11. All these expressions are contrary to the idea of hope, signifying, I've endured the day with its pain and despair without hope of goodness and well-being. Now, to admit that Philo got his etymologies a little confused was apparently not accepted 
brought to Muscat, and I spoke about his own rather fanciful etymologies. <clears throat> Instead, he defended Philo's bizarre etymology by reinforcing the idea of an antiosomy to Odad, as it was known in medieval Arabic and Hebrew grammars, namely that opposite meanings or connotations belong to one and the same word. Thus, according to Moscato's interpretation, Hilo was privy to a linguistic tradition that transmitted the innate nature of the Hebrew language. Hoping God began with Enosh, that is man, Adam, and the following verse, this is the history of man, Adam, encapsulated this definition of the true man. Now, Philo's insight into this matter was for Moscato as previous, <clears throat> as precious as those of the rabbis and Kabbalists, whom he cites on the same topic. In fact, here, as in other of his citations of Philo, it is clear that he perceived the Philonic thread that ran through Jewish traditions and gave it prominence amidst the rich tapestries of his own spiritual reflections and exaltation. Harry Austrin Wolfson, the Dwayan of Jewish philosophy, would have been greatly satisfied. After all, according to Wilson, it was the radical innovations of Philo that had set the scene for the long history of religious philosophy. In the same sermon, Moscato cited a passage from Midrash Ruth Rabbah, which he had also presented in, <clears throat> as the Ma'ama for his sermon for the second day of Shavuot. This Midrash, clearly a favorite one with him, takes up the image of wings as associated with the earth, dawn, sun, cherubim and seraphim in various scriptural verses. The Midrash then reaches the grand finale. Great is the power of those who toil in Torah. In whose shadow do they find shelter? In the shadow of the one at whose word the world was created, as is said, how precious is your loving kindness, O God. Human beings find shelter in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 36a. The subject of the sermon is Torah and discuss the relation to intellect and to conduct. More precisely, all elements in the Midrash are said to represent different philosophical concepts. The earth stands for matter, the dawn, the imaginative faculty, the sun, the rational faculty, the cherubim relate to the two faculties of intellectual apprehension, while the seraphim signify the intellect, acquired through apprehension of the intelligibles. The culmination of the passage with its reference to God signify that only those who fly with the intellection of God's Torah will ascend to the heavenly pinnacle of intellectual knowledge and good ethical traits. Again, the disquisition is long and complex. Suffice to say that the striking image of the wind enacted in this Midrash is transformed into a philosophical disquisition that aims to discount the mere natural element. Yet even here, Moscato brings together Plato and the sages when he states, it was common for the sages to explain wings as components of the rational soul. I seem to remember that Plato was said to describe speculative and practical reason by the term wings of the soul. Here, Moscato has carefully formulated his reference to Plato. It is said of Indeed, this is a reference, it seems to be a reference to the Phaedrus, but not actually to Plato's Phaedrus, but to Marsilio's Ficino's Latin commentary and summary of the Platonic dialogue, the famous Latin, everybody who's reading his translations, his Latin translations and summaries of the dialogues. Reading Proclus and the other Neoplatonic writers, Ficino understood the wings in the myth of the charioteer as a lifting power that are divinely implanted in the intellect and reason. I would claim that Piccino's reading of Phaedrus had more than a passing impact on Moscato. In his capacity as rabbi, preacher, and above all pedagogue, he transposed Piccino's allegorization of the charity of his wings. Rejecting the ultimate benefit of philosophical disciplines, he finally asserted that only God's perfect Torah will enable us to send to the heights of heaven and find shelter under his wing. Now, in his authoritative work on the Song of Songs, Michael Fishbane described the philosophical approach to the song, for whom the text, I quote, is a carefully designed structure of philosophical instruction. The reader is instructed and the commentator, not solely an exegete, adept, adept or allegorical disclosure, but a philosophical master 
cultivating his disciple. And I would like to claim that this could said also be said to be true of Moscato as he set out to cultivate his disciples and congregants and Christians.